all we will begin in next two minutes kindly take your seats Good evening, all. I now invite Dr. C. Rangarajan to pay floral tribute and request Sanjana to escort. So this side. Dr. T. V. Somanathan, sir. Mr. Vikram Kapoor. Dr. K. S. Kavikumar. Mr. Gangadharan. Mr. Arun Ramachandran. And Mr. Ganapati. Please raise for Tamil Thai Valte.
Thank you. I now request Ms. Kalyani to recognize uh, Dr. Rangarajan. I now invite Mr. Arun Ramachandran to recognize Dr. T.V. Swaminathan. Ms. Sharda Ganpati to recognize Mr. Vikram. Mr. Ganapati will recognize Dr. Kavi Kumar. I now hand over the proceedings to Mr. Ganapati, son of late G. Ramachandran. I now formally request Professor Kavi Kumar to Welcome all of us. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the School of Economics on this somewhat muggy, but still a pleasant Saturday afternoon, uh, rather evening. Um, I would like to first uh, warmly invite and uh, welcome Dr. T. V. Somanathan, um, Finance Secretary, Government of India, who has kindly agreed to deliver um, G. Ramachandran um, endowment lecture at MSc. Um, the title of the lecture uh, is quite apt and contemporary. And, um, and I, I, I'm looking forward to, um, as many of you would be, to see the, the pertinent comments and observations to be provided by Dr. Somnathan. Also would like to invite uh, and welcome Dr. our beloved chairman, Dr. Angarajan. Um, we got uh, kind of got used to uh, hearing astute comments and observations by Dr. Rangarajan on most of the deliberations and I'm um, looking forward to the same. Would like to extend warm welcome to Mr. Vikram Kapoor, President Chief Secretary, Government of Tamil Nadu, who has kindly spared his time to be with us today. Um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Ganapati and his family, distinguished guests in the audience, and MSc family um, to be to this particular event. Um, let me take a few minutes to uh, say a few words about uh, Madras School of Economics. Uh, Madras School of Economics is a um, uh, child or uh, outcome of the vision of uh, two great economists. Um, our founder chairman, Dr. Raja Chalaya, and our current chairman, Dr. Rangarajan, and many eminent uh, uh, personalities in our board. We have thought that uh, in the southern part of India, we need an uh, institute of higher education and economics, and also as a think tank uh, for providing policy inputs to both state and central government. And that's how the Meta School of Economics came into existence. Uh, it's been a, a long journey. Uh, we have uh, completed more than 25 years. We are now in the closing, close to 30 years now. Uh, we have established ourselves as a center of excellence in higher education and economics and related subjects. Um, we have been associated with a number of institutions over the last 25 plus years, including Anna University, Central University of Tamil Nadu, um, and also in, uh, Indira Gandhi National Open University. Uh, we have um, we have been offering master's program in economics uh, for all these years. Um, in 2018, in our Silo Jubilee year, uh, we were actually given the status of um, given the status of higher technical institution by AACT, that is the um, All India Council for Technical Education, based on which we have uh, started our uh, uh, program in PGDM uh, in business and finance. And these two programs have been continuing since then. Um, in last year, that's the 2021, 
April, we were recognized as Institute of Special Importance by Tamil Nadu government. And um, based on that, we have now the uh, kind of ability to give our own degrees. And based on that, we have also started a bachelor's program. So we have now several programs uh, compared to what we, where we started in 1993. We are now have several programs, including master's program, in, uh, which is our main focus, of course. And PGDM continues to be main focus, PGDM in finance and uh, business analytics. We have BA honors in economics, and of course, PhD program. Uh, all these have uh, led to a number of our student population has also increased over time. Uh, we work on a number of uh, areas of um, uh, economic interests, uh, policy interests. Uh, we have been center of excellence in environmental economics recognized by Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change Government of India for several years. Uh, we, we have established uh, a, a decision making, decision science lab in association with GE labs. Uh, G. E. Mani. So we have also over time done a number of project works which have led to um, several policy inputs in both state and central governments. And um, we, we have um, more than 170 projects completed over the time and continuing to prosper with your blessings. And um, we would, um, we have actually four prestigious endowment lectures at MSc. Um, Sage MSc endowment lecture, uh, Dr. Um, um, we have the um, Raja Chalaya memorial lecture, we have Arvan Ketraman memorial lecture, and of course this particular one. And we had, this one is the latest entry into our endowment lecture series. Uh, last year, uh, our beloved chairman, Dr. Rangarajan delivered the first endowment lecture under this series. And we are very happy to have Dr. T.V. Somanathan with us today to deliver the second endowment lecture under this series. Um, I welcome you all again to Madras School of Economics. Looking forward for an engaging evening. Thank you very much. A great friend of the family and a very distinguished uh, bureaucrat is Vikram Kapoor. I now invite him to pay tribute to my late father. Vikram. Respected Dr. Rangarajan, Chairman Madras School of Economics, Honorable Minister for Finance and HRM, Government of Tamil Nadu, Chief Guest of the Evening, and my esteemed senior colleague, Dr. T.B. Somanathan, IAS, Finance Secretary, Government of India, founder of this endowment lecture series, and my well-wisher, Sri Ganapati, Mrs. Ganapati, and all members of late Sri Ramachandran's family, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, Manakam. It is my privilege to pay my tribute to an outstanding son of our great nation, an exemplary civil servant, and most of all, a humane and noble soul, late Sri G. Ramachandran IAS, in whose memory this endowment lecture has been organized. Friends, the renowned American poet, H.W. Longfellow wrote in a Psalm of Life, the following lines, and I quote, lives of great men all remind us, we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Viewed in the context of our vast civilizational history, we are all aware of how transient human life is. Yet even in this limited time available to us, we can bring purpose to our existence. And those of us who elevate their lives for the betterment of others, indeed leave their mark for future generations to cherish. But like footprints on the sands that disappear with time, most of such sublime souls get forgotten in due course. So why do good in the first place, if one were to be eventually consigned to the pages of history? Karmanya vadhikaraste ma faleshu kadachana. 
in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna answers this question. When he extols Arjuna to only focus on his karma or duty without yearning for the fruit or the outcomes of his labors. He who understands that this is the purpose of his existence is a karma yogi. In a way, this is the gist of the Gita and this is what public service is all about. Doing good for others or parokkar. Sri Ji Ramachandran was one such shining example of what a karma yogi is. He was the epitome of what values the civil service should aspire for. In fact, this is beautifully captured in the final sentences of his autobiographical memoir, Walking with Giants, in which he quotes from the Ramayana, which he regularly read till the end. And I quote, in Sundara Kandam, Sita says, she asked Rama himself, you are a man of many virtues. What do you think is the best of these characteristics? Rama says without a moment's hesitation, it is my ability, it is my inability to put up with the sufferings of others, unquote. A devout believer of the Lord, G. Ramachandran, true to his name, devoted his entire life as a civil servant to bringing succor to the suffering masses. His early career as a district officer, when the country was in the throes of a painful birth as a free yet impoverished nation, showed his compassionate side. As a sub-collector in Malabar district, when he was called upon to hear the pleas of deserted women for maintenance, he went out of the way to help them get justice by outsmarting litigant lawyers. In yet another case, he stood up for the rights of farmers whose land was being sought to be acquired by the relative of a powerful minister. Always a people's officer, GR, as he was called by his peers and admirers, during his stint as collector of Coimbatore, sowed the seeds for a vibrant Panchayati Raj system, which he, in true Gandhian style, encouraged to raise resources at the local level and improve the governance of our villages by entrusting powers to public representatives. This reformist streak was carried forward by him in his role as a policymaker, both at the state and central level. Sri Ramachandran was a brilliant student in his school and college days, topping his grade, topping his class in all grades. No wonder he aced the list of IAS recruits of the 1949 batch as well. He brought his academic erudition to bear on his work as secretary of the finance department in the state of Tamil Nadu, and ultimately as finance secretary in the government of India. Few people may be aware that it was GR who planted the idea of bank nationalization in the mind of the then prime minister, and thereafter helped to prepare the blueprint for its rollout. He can also be credited for being the brain behind the famous 20 point program that became the benchmark for monitoring crucial programs of the government. However, present day bureaucrats may wonder how he was chosen for such key assignments at a relatively early stage of his career and went on to hold equally important positions under different governments with a pantheon of powerful political personalities, very often adversarial to each other. Essentially, Jia's acceptance as a reliable civil aid to such a divergent group of political masters in itself is a tribute to his enormous credibility and unimpeachable integrity. For him, it was always nation first. His self-effacing demeanor found acceptance with leaders across the political spectrum who leaned on him for advice or even intervention in complicated matters. It is rare to find a civil servant who so effortlessly strode all arms of the executive without a stain on his persona. G. Ramachandran was not born with a silver spoon. His humble background almost left him unlettered, but for the fortuitous change of circumstances 
that ensured that he got enrolled in the only elementary school in his native village. Yet, by the sheer dint of his brilliance and hard work, he eventually went up the ladder of success to reach the pinnacle of civil service. A small village boy ended up advising the prime minister of the country. But he never lost touch with his roots. The way he fought for handloom weavers early on in his career in the state of Tamil Nadu, and later on for agricultural tenants through land reforms at the national level, always silently and behind the scenes, is testimony to his love and caring for the marginalized sections of the society. The legacy that GR left behind is etched not just in the annals of the administrative history of India, but as indelible footprints in the sands of time and really large footprints at that, those of a colossus among public servants. For generations of civil servants, Sri G. Ramachandran was and will remain a role model. For family and friends, he was and will remain their beacon. To me, he was and will remain a giant. Thank you. Before I invite a friend, a relative, a friend of our finance minister who has, honorably, who has been kind enough to grace this occasion, Dr. PTR, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for honoring the occasion, sir. I now invite a cousin of mine who is also a friend of yours but lives in London, live from London because he doesn't want to go through the stress of going through London Heathrow time and again, partner of TPG, the first Harvard graduate from our family, Karthik Jairaman from London. Karthik, allow with some coffee. I know you just landed from Frankfurt a few minutes ago. Go ahead, Karthik. Your friend is here also. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Karthik. Um, thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, my apologies for not there in person, but um, I just want to reiterate how deeply humbled and delighted I'm, uh, I am to have this opportunity to introduce uh, Mr. G. Ram Chandran. Uh, humbled because what he's accomplished professionally and in his service to India, and delighted because he had a deep personal lasting influence on me. While most of you know him as the finance secretary, a lucky few of us knew him as our IAS Peripa. The reason I still fondly remember him is because of this amazing multifaceted man that he was. I got to know him through my teenage years and into my early adult life. Um, and so while we recognize his achievements today, I wanted to share some personal notes uh, to this personal side of him, his rigor, his integrity, his generosity to the younger generation and his general appetite for life. To begin with, as you probably guessed, he excelled academically. He did, he did well starting with his high school, his, through his college years and culminating in his IAS exams, um, class first and distinctions at every stage. It led to a very distinguished career, as you just heard, serving several chief ministers and eventually becoming the youngest officer to become the finance secretary. The bar had been set very clearly, but more importantly, the path had been paved and the road was clear. If he could, from a very humble village and humble beginnings, reach the corridors of power, then the path through academic rigor was one well worth embracing. I knew that even if I wanted to get ahead in life, the road to take was clear. He'd shown the path. He was also a man of great personal integrity and principle. In a world in which power and money can corrupt even the incorruptible, he stood firmly by his principles. This is not something he just spoke about or practiced in his professional life, but this is something he lived with in every day of his personal life as we as his family got to see up close. To me personally, this above all defined his humanity. And this is what I remember. As I reflect on any challenge that I face today, the answer is always at the end of a very simple question. What would a principled person do in this situation? No matter how far he was from home, he was a family man at heart, 
and never forgot his duties and responsibilities to his families and friends. The village was never far away from him. While his achievements can be daunting and frankly intimidating, he remained a very approachable and relatable person. I recall a few occasions in my 20s when I was full of energy and exuberance, probably bordering even on arrogance. He was always willing to engage patiently. I learned a lot from him about the Indian economy, and I recall vividly various discussions on Indian inflation in the 70s. What I recall more was this man whose guiding hand shaped the Indian economy for decades to come. But here he was engaging with a 20-something me, very generous with his time and always calm, clear, and concise in his views. It is this generosity and patience with which he engaged with the younger generations, not just me, which is a valuable lesson in passing along the knowledge of a life well lived. His interests expanded well beyond finance and government policy. I recall many afternoons spending uh, watching cricket in that office of his. He was also a well-read man. While most will recall his love of novels, probably by people like Woodhouse or Christie, I personally took more of his interest in history to heart. He encouraged this personal growth. As my own interest grew, one day he recommended A.L. Bashan's book on Indian history. To this day, I read that book every year or every two years. Not sure because I do it because it's a great discourse on Indian history, but probably more likely that I recall him recommending this book. This is my way of letting him know that I've read it again. So while we recognize his towering achievements today, let us also recall that he was a consummate human and left an indelible impression on many people. With that, let me hand it to Mother. Thanks, Karthik. Get some rest. To introduce a legend, I now invite our, my niece, Madhura Ganesh, who is a chartered accountant herself. And she, not that Dr. Swaminathan needs any introduction, but I think we need to highlight some of his achievements just that much more. Madhu. Thank you. Uh, very good evening to everyone, dignitaries on the dais. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and honor to introduce Sri Dr. T.V. Somanathan, the most distinguished and sought after bureaucrat in the nation. Sri Somanathan is a 1987 batch Indian Administrative Services Officer, ranked two All India and was awarded the gold medal for the best IAS probationer of his batch. He is presently the Finance Secretary of India, Department of Expenditure, Earlier, he was the additional secretary and joint secretary in the prime minister's office. Prior to this, he was working as director at the World Bank on a deputation from the Indian Administrative Service from 2011 to 2015. Interestingly, Sri G. Ramachandran was also on a special deputation to the Asian Development Bank. In 1969, Sri G. Ramachandran was handpicked for the post of joint secretary by the Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. Sri TV Somanathan has earlier worked in several senior positions in the government of Tamil Nadu state, including the Deputy Secretary Budget, Joint Vigilance Commissioner, Executive Director Metro Water, Secretary to Chief Minister, Additional Chief Secretary and Commissioner of Commercial Taxes. As a founder of CMRL, he was responsible for achieving financial closure and awarding the initial tenders for implementing the 14,600 crore Chennai Metro Rail project. He has published over 80 papers and articles in journals and newspapers on economics, finance, and public policy. It is indeed gracious of Sri Somanathan to have accepted today's invitation to deliver the G. Ramachandran Endowment Lecture. The topic cannot be more fitting development in the changing times, the role of government efficiency. Dr. T.V. Somanathan holds a PhD in economics and has also completed his executive development program at the Harvard Business School and is a fully qualified cost and company secretary, both in India and England. Coming from an accounting background, 
While we do understand expenditure in real terms, in real numbers, the differentiating factor that an intellectual like Sri Dr. Somanathan brings in is rather interesting. He stresses on the need for fiscal discipline to make the economy stronger and suggests reforming poorly targeted subsidies, such as those provided for electricity and fertilizers to improve the quality of public expenditure. I also wish to highlight a few of his ideas which have had great acclaim and recognition in the past. First and foremost, state and central government need prudent and conservative fiscal policies, which is absolutely critical. He also emphasizes on the importance of reducing the fiscal deficit, particularly at the central level, minimizing external debt, as well as fostering a strong domestic investment climate. He draws attention on the need to improve the quality of our public expenditure with a greater share for areas which help to promote growth. To achieve this, he believes we have to reform poorly targeted subsidies like those in electricity and fertilizers without which the quality of public expenditure would suffer. India's leadership in developing world-class technologies like the unique identity, unified bank payments, is way ahead of not just developing countries, but developed countries as well. And it is in this context, he also emphasizes on judicial use of unique identification numbers, which will help identifying targeted subsidies that India needs. He also said, says that we should start looking at emerging sectors like international solar energy. He has pointed out that the ongoing balance of payment crisis in Sri Lanka shows the declining role of the IMF. The role of China and India in Sri Lanka has been far greater than that of the IMF. The situation is such that the multinational agencies that were driving the change in 1944 are no longer doing it. And that is the change. There is no one better than Sri Dr. Stevie Somanathan to address today's topic on development of changing times the role of government efficiency. His concepts on prioritized subsidies will certainly help the government's role in taking India on the targeted growth trajectory. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the most distinguished bureaucrat, Dr. Sri T. V. Somanathan. Dr. Rangarajan, Honorable Finance Minister of Tamil Nadu, Mr. Ganapati, Mr. Vikram Kapoor, Mr. Gangadharan, Mr. Ramachandran, Professor Kavi Kumar, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today to deliver the G. Ramachandran Endowment Lecture. We have already heard a fulsome tribute to Mr. Ramachandran, but I wish to add my own. I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Ramachandran in the early 90s when I was Deputy Secretary in the Finance Department. He had actually come to give us some suggestions on the approach that the government of Tamil Nadu should take to the Finance Commission, which was then chaired by Mr. K.C. Pant. I actually don't recall what he said then, to be honest. But I do recall that my boss, Mr. N. Narayanan, who was then the finance secretary and was probably one of the longest serving finance secretaries of any state, not only held Mr. Ramachandran in high esteem, but also took whatever he said with great seriousness. So as a young officer, when your boss takes somebody very seriously, you also think that that person is very important. So I just distinctly remember him. I happen now to sit in the same room that Mr. Ramachandran sat in in 1976, and I'm also intrigued by some similarities in my recent career path with his. He was Joint Secretary and later Additional Secretary in what was then called the Prime Minister's Secretariat and is now called the Prime Minister's Office. And then he became Secretary Expenditure, and he then became Finance Secretary. I have actually happened to hold those four positions also. Uh, Mr. Ramachandran worked under diametrically different governments in the, towards the end of his career, 
starting as expenditure secretary under Mrs. Indira Gandhi's government, continuing as finance secretary under both Mr. Moradji Desai's government and Mr. Charan Singh's government, and then continuing under Mrs. Gandhi again. The fact that four different prime ministers and uh, five finance ministers decided to keep him on is a testimony to the professionalism and political neutrality that he exhibited. And it's a shining example for civil servants like us. His memoirs, which my friend Dr. Vikram Kapoor referred to, are replete with interesting anecdotes. And what strikes me is that many of the struggles and issues that he faced are still the struggles and issues <laughs> that we face today. Uh, so there is a permanence about these things, which is nice to see. And it makes me feel better sometimes when uh, I see that this also existed in 1976. Uh, I must uh, state that uh, the views I express here are purely personal. They are not the views of the, uh, not necessarily the views of the government of India or of Tamil Nadu or any such thing. Uh, as a civil servant, you will also recognize my limitations when I speak. So like a good civil servant, I may say less about the things you actually want to hear about and more about the things that you don't want to hear about. Uh, there is one more thing I wanted to mention. There was a reference to the founding of Madras School of Economics. I want to mention that one of the founding fathers of the Madras School of Economics is the government of Tamil Nadu. Because I was Deputy Secretary of Finance when I accompanied Dr. Raja Chalaya on the first visit to this plot of land, which actually belonged to the Finance Department of Government of Tamil Nadu under the Government Data Center. I think Mr. Sripati was in Government Data Center at the time. So yeah. The first score was given by Mr. K. Mr. That's right. So the, the, this was actually a project which was sponsored by the Government of Tamil Nadu. And I think I, I must, it is my duty to point out the Government of Tamil Nadu is a co-founder of this institution and was the donor of the land on which we are sitting now. Uh, I also remember then uh, just an anecdote that uh, I remember a, 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 this is just a, a, a side distinction from what I'm going to talk about. I remember coming with Dr. Chalaya in the car along with Mr. A.C. Mutaya and somewhere in this plot of land we were sitting and Dr. Chalaya was speaking about the fact that we had too many exemptions in the Income Tax Act as we were coming in the car. And then we came here and in the discussion with Mr. Mutaya, it centered on how Section 35 AC needs to be amended to include economics institutions for exemption. And I remember being struck as a civil servant about the dichotomy between the, you know, <laughs> the general and the specific, in any case. So um, I must say that I am honored and also slightly intimidated by the presence of such distinguished personalities as the finance minister of Tamil Nadu, scholars like Dr. Rangarajan, practitioners like Mr. Venkateshan, Mr. Sripati, my friend, Dr. Vikram Kapoor, and scholar practitioners like Mr. Ashok Vardhan Shetty which I'm honored, but I'm also intimidated because it means uh, that whatever you say is under a lot of critical scrutiny. And there are people here who can call any bluff that you may attempt, uh, which will make me even more taciturn than I am usually. <laughs> so uh, let me now turn to the topic of today's lecture. So as you all know, India is celebrating the 75th year of its independence. And in his uh, 75th anniversary Independence Day speech, the Prime Minister called for India to become a developed country by 2047 in what he has called the Amuda Kalam. Now, what does it entail if India is to become a developed country by 2047? Now, in this lecture, I will focus narrowly on the concept of income and per capita income rather than on development in its much wider and broader connotation just as an oversimplification, development has many dimensions other than income, but I will focus primarily on that. The World Bank no longer classifies countries as developed, less developed, underdeveloped, et cetera. It rather uses income. I mean, it has lower income, middle, lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income. So for all practical purposes, let's assume that a developed country is one which is a high income country. In that case, taking the current World Bank definition of what is a high income country and escalating that at about one and a half percent real per annum for the next 25 years, India would need to have a per capita income of about $18,000 in 2047 in order to be classified as a developed country. So what we need to do is to get from about approximately $2,300, which is where we are today, in, uh, in market exchange rate terms to approximately $18,000. So 
Some calculations that we have done indicate that we would need to grow at an average of roughly seven to seven and a half percent compound for this entire quarter century to get there, but with a higher starting growth rate in the initial decade, which would have to be approximately 8%. In recent times, a lot of attention has been paid to the growth of China and Japan, now China and earlier Japan. In the decade of the 1960s, Japan grew at an average of 10.7% per annum real GDP. And in the first decade of this century, China grew at approximately 9.5% per annum. Similar growth rates were witnessed in countries like South Korea, Taiwan, during their so-called takeoff periods. Much of the current conversation around India's growth is based on the track record of East Asia and more particularly China, which is similar to us in terms of size, population, and so on. And also similar in its starting point in 1979. The other thing that we often hear, and this is also very, it's an important point that a lot of people make, which is that we have a narrow demographic window in which to achieve developed country status. And if we don't catch this window, if we don't use this window, we may never get there. Thus, there are two widely held views about India in the next quarter of century, which with slight oversimplification and exaggeration, I'll characterize as follows. One, that we have to grow at eight to 10% to get there. And two, if we miss this quarter of a century with the demographic dividend, we may be doomed to mediocrity forever. So these are two sort of widespread uh, impressions that are held and with good reason. But let us look a little further than East Asia and at other developed countries. Let me start with the United Kingdom. So between, 19, between 1870 and 2000, the median growth rate of the United Kingdom was 2.5%, and the peak growth rate was 3.2%. The United States from 1870 to 2000, the median was 3.4%, and the peak rate was 4.4%, if I exclude war periods which are artificially high because of statistical uh, features. In Germany, the median rate, 3.4%, and the peak rate was 8.8%, but that was the post-war boom uh, under the Marshall Plan. In France, the median was 27 and the peak was 5.7%. Of course, the reasons for these different growth rates, different periods, different circumstances in each country, many historical non-similarities, but again, with deliberate oversimplification, I'm going to do a lot of oversimplification today for which you must uh, bear with me. Let me say the following. It is a fact that countries have become developed countries without ever even reaching a 6% growth rate. So it is not as if the only way to become a developed country is to emulate the China Japan model of rapid growth over 25 years. So there are other ways of reaching. Second, Countries have become developed with very different kinds of demographic structures over the period that they became developed. Now, today we think about the demographic problem in terms of falling birth rates, but some of these developed countries have had huge death rates at certain critical periods in their uh, evolution, either I mean, mostly due to war. I mean, the civil war in the United States killed a huge percentage, I mean, in relative terms of the American population between 1860 and 1865. The First World War killed a huge amount of the male population in France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. And so did the Second World War in Japan, as well as many parts of uh, uh, Europe. And in Russia too. In spite of that, they have reached where they have reached. So these are obstacles, but it is not as if you need a particular demographic pattern in order to become developed. And therefore, while we need to be concerned about India's growth rate, and while, of course, India needs to grow as fast as it can and it must, there is no need to panic if we don't grow at some particular targeted rate of growth uh, or we don't necessarily grow as fast as China or Japan in their peak periods of growth. And nor should we uh, assume that if we miss the demographic bullet train, we will never travel to our destination. We may get there in a slower train, but we might still get there. So I think we need to have a, a very realistic approach to how India will become a developed country. And uh, in this connection,
Let me return to China's takeoff, which was roughly a 25 year period from 1994 to 2019. I have artificially chosen that because it's a 25 period and I want to speak about the next 25 years. So in that period from 1994 to 2019, what were some of the characteristics of the global economy? One, there was a rapid liberalization of international trade. So the WTO was formed in 1995 and China was admitted despite not meeting the basic rules for admission because it was felt that if they were admitted, they would later become uh, conformist with the uh, norms of a market economy. This period was characterized by increasing globalization, which was also manifested in offshoring of investment and offshoring of supply chains. It was a period when there was a lot of lip service by Western countries to environment and environmental sustainability but very few actual sanctions against those who didn't conform. It was a period when there was a steady decrease in great power conflict because you had less of the US-USSR conflict, the USSR-China conflict, US-China conflict, and so on. And for most of this period, especially after the 90s, with small interregna in between, interest rates tended to fall. Global interest rates in Western market economies tended to fall for most of the years in this 25 year period. Another feature was that most of the world, excepting Europe and North America, had a young population. Now let's look at the Amuda Kalam, 2022 to 2047. It's likely that we will see increasing restrictions on international trade. Of course, the, uh, trying to predict the next 25 years is much more difficult than assessing the last 25 years. And many of the trends that I'm seeing today may reverse themselves and be wrong. But let's for a moment make an assumption that the trends we see today will be projected forward for 25 years. So restrictions on international trade, we are already seeing the beginning of many restrictions on international trade. There is already a tendency to onshore or friend shore. Friend shore meaning keep your supply chain in friendly countries. Don't allow your supply chain to be dominated by countries that are not friendly to you. Third, we may see forceful action by developed countries on climate change. Now, it's possible we may also see some funding for climate change, but we may just see the talk and not see the funding also. These are both possibilities. We may see an increase in great power conflict. We are beginning to see some signs of it. And uh, we are beginning this period with higher interest rates than the preceding, uh, at least the trend is upward, not downward. And lastly, now we are entering a quarter century when the young population of the world will be primarily in India and Sub-Saharan Africa and not elsewhere. Now, of these changes that I have listed, some are favorable to India's progress. So the fact that we are one of the young population islands in the world is favorable. The fact that there might be some funding for climate change may be favorable if it comes. We'll see it when it comes. We'll believe it when we see it. Uh, the tendency to onshore or friendshore may or may not be an opportunity depending on how we seize this opportunity. And the restrictions on international trade will be negative for us in terms of having to grow into a negative trade environment rather than into a growing trade environment where China was able to expand. We in India, whether citizens or journalists, uh, administrators or politicians, are awestruck by many aspects of China's phenomenally successful growth in the last quarter century. Some of these features which are genuinely impressive are uh, things like the speed with which land is acquired or clearances are given for various projects, the unified approach of national and municipal governments in getting something done, the high rate of investment that China has been able to sustain for a long period of time. So these are obviously extremely important ingredients in China's success. There is much cause for admiration. But is there cause for emulation? It's a little difficult to answer that question. I have found that trying to copy Chinese models in Indian conditions is subject to severe limitations. We are a democracy, China is not. Ours is a far more diverse country, far more diverse federation, a more federal federation than is China. 
and so on. So, I mean, I can keep pointing to the various differences between India and China. And therefore, I'm not sure that those most obvious characteristics of Chinese growth are easy for us to copy. In fact, we may have to find our own way of growing, which is not necessarily the way that China grew, because we may not be able to do what they did. We may have to do something different. There is one aspect of China's growth, which we do not very often comment on, but which actually I think holds uh, something that we need to take a lesson from. China's growth was mainly based on high investment, not on high productivity. There are studies which show that the share of total factor productivity in China's growth is less than 25%. And this is contrasted with a much higher share for the European and American economies in their heyday of growth in different times, not in these times, but at other times. So the Chinese economy has grown through a huge amount of investment, a lot of investment, high domestic savings rate, a lot of foreign investment. So a lot of money has been put into this economy and it has grown and it has grown fast. In fact, in terms of productivity and efficiency, the Chinese, uh, China was notorious for its ghost cities. In fact, there have been large concrete cities, entire cities almost, capable of housing lakhs of people, which remained empty for years together. Some of them still are, some are not. Creating a city and leaving it empty for say 10 years is extremely inefficient economics. That is a waste of resources for 10 years lying unutilized. And this shows you the downside of some of the you know, highly focused, uni unified, driven kind of policies that a country like that can implement, which India is neither able nor perhaps should implement. There are empty buildings in India too. I know the OMR used to have a lot of them even quite recently, but nowhere on the Chinese scale. The scale of these property bubbles in India are nothing compared to the uh, ghost cities of China. India as a democracy has certain strengths that we often don't appreciate. So openness to feedback, diversity of ideas and practices between states, strength in the services sector, which is not China's strength, a vibrant press, an active civil society. These are important institutions because what it leads to is that we have an advantage in terms of continuous corrective feedback to the policies that we implement. And in this respect, I would suggest that India is at an advantage. So if ghost cities are one end of the spectrum, solar panels uh, being put on railway stations is another end of uh, the spectrum in terms of efficient use of available resources. So the short point which I want to make is one area where India can do better than China, if it really wishes to, is in being more efficient, more productive in the use of perhaps more limited resources, because the resource position may not be as abundant as it was in China's time. Now, before I go on to the remainder of my talk, let me clarify that I'm not saying that efficiency is the only thing we need to improve. Far from it. There are many things which are very important um, and you know, fiscal discipline, quality of public expenditure, trade policy, any number of policies that we have to improve and get right. But these are widely commented upon. So I'm not going to talk much about them. And also as a civil servant, I prefer not to talk about them. So I'm going to focus on one area which is less commented upon but which I think is actually very important, which is government efficiency. So here too, I'm going to limit myself to issues that are non-political. So there is efficiency of the country, the economy, and then there is efficiency of the government. And then there is the efficiency of the non-political part of the government. And it is the last that I'm going to focus on. So let me touch upon four issues, which I think are uh, where we need as a, uh, uh, as a country to improve in the way that our governments work. One is delegation of decision-making by the uh, administrative part of government. There's an increasing tendency for administrative decisions to be taken at higher and higher levels of government and at higher and higher levels of the bureaucracy. And it is also 
a tendency for these to be increasingly taken by collective units of committees or boards or empowered groups and so on. The implicit principle or logic which is supposed to underlie this uh, you know, increase in the level at which decisions are taken is first, the lower ranks are less competent. This is the assumption number one. Number two, the lower ranks are more corrupt. Assumption number two, collective decisions are better than individual decisions. Assumption number three. So these are probably three foundational assumptions of this tendency. So let us examine these assumptions. I am, I mean, as, as one who is at the, you know, retirement end of the civil service spectrum, I find little evidence that on average top bureaucrats are more competent than junior bureaucrats. I don't find that to be, you know, necessarily the case. Second, I also don't find evidence to suggest that top bureaucrats are less corrupt than entry level bureaucrats. I don't find this also to be the case. And in fact, I find that competence and integrity are almost equally distributed in the population of young officers and old officers and the standard deviation and the mean are approximately the same at different ends of this uh, spectrum. And equally, I don't find that collective decisions are necessarily better than individual decisions if because if a collective decision reduces everything to the collective average, then and if the best is not taken and the average is taken, you're actually reducing the quality of the decision, hopefully you are not going to the bottom because the committee means that you don't go to the bottom. So that's the advantage, but you may also not go to the top. So these three things, and then there is the fourth and most important point. Why is this not good for efficiency in government? The time taken in these decisions is far more the higher the level of the decision and the more the involvement of a committee. It takes far, far longer for a decision to be taken when a more senior officer has to take it because it's not as if he takes it alone. He takes it on the basis of inputs from every officer below him. So the more levels a decision has to cross, the longer it takes to be taken. And this is something which I think, and why have these structures come about? One is deliberate. When you, when you have more people taking a decision, it is, you know, the, the total responsibility for the decision is divided by N, where N is the number of people is taking the decision. So the individual level of responsibility for anything going wrong changes from one to one by N. So this is one reason. And I cannot blame the officers for doing this because the kind of anti-corruption law that this country has had for a long time, at least between 1988 and 2018, was actually one where an officer could be accused of corruption despite not having done anything with a corrupt intent. But anyway, that law has also been amended. The second reason is that there is an automatic inflationary effect whereby if you define powers in financial terms and say up to one lakh rupees with so and so level, then with relatively high inflation, very soon the real value of that one lakh becomes 50,000 rupees. And if it's not changed, then over a period of time, more and more decisions go up the chain. So the one sort of simplistic remedy that I would suggest is as a simple rule of thumb in every post and in every department, increase the level of delegation. I mean, it's a sort of simplistic, may not always be correct, but it's a sort of general rule that whatever level of delegation you have, increase it. Increase it at least by the level of uh, inflation since it was last raised and probably even more than that. Um, the second thing that I want to refer to is supervision. At its core, supervision is the act of ensuring that what is supposed to be done is actually done. It's as simple as that. That is what a supervisor is expected to do. Traditional bureaucratic uh, machinery, the traditional Indian bureaucratic machinery had supervision as one of its strengths. It was one of the strong points of the ICS bureaucracy and the early IAS bureaucracy. So there were systems of office inspections, there were systems of review, there were systems where a senior officer would visit the taluk office, would have to inspect at least so many RIs, uh, chow trees, and make sure that what was supposed to be done was done. In recent times, we have stopped doing this to a large extent. And we don't, this traditional discipline of simply making sure that what is to be done is done has declined substantially. Earlier, the assumption was if there's a rule or standard, on average, it was followed. Today, if there's a rule or standard, on average, it is not followed. Now, this is a big difference in the performance of the bureaucracy. So 
today we talk a lot we've all acquired the talk we now don't talk about targets we talk about kpis key performance indicators and we have dashboards in which the key performance indicator is put but is the data in the dashboard correct is the key performance indicator actually relevant and has the person actually achieved the key performance indicator that he was supposed to achieve or she was supposed to achieve? These have sort of gone into the background. So I think we are now paying more attention to the setting of goals and the manner in which goals are set and the manner in which goals are announced than to the actual achievement of those goals. And its goals are not merely quantitative, they have a quality dimension. Have we achieved the qualitative dimension of what was set? Here, the thing I would like to say is that modern information technology and digital tools are useful. They have a lot of potential, but only if combined with the traditional disciplines of actual monitoring, supervision, field visits, and you know, keeping in touch with the citizenry. If the two are combined, they can be a powerful and potent mix, but one is not a substitute for the other. And this is the second point that I'd like to make. The third is, I think we will probably need to improve efficiency by changing the incentives of the civil service by changing rules because a feature of government today is the unwillingness of officers to exercise the powers vested in them so the, an officer has the power to do something but he says look i can't do this go to court if the court gives me an order i'll do it now this is a this is a certain uh, tendency which is very widespread again i i sympathize because i have also worked in the system. I know why people do it. And they're not necessarily bad people. Many of them are very good people. So there's a fear of audit. There is a fear of vigilance and the fear that courts will find fault with them for exercising discretion that is legally vested in them because courts also take very varying interpretations of the same decision, depending on which court, which time, which judge, etc. So it's very uncertain for an officer to assume that a particular decision will or will not be upheld, even if he follows all the Wednesbury principles. And all the, there are various principles which have been laid down, but the courts often don't follow them. So the administrator follows them even less. Therefore, it is very difficult for an administrator to exercise discretion. But there are some things that we could do. All of these problems cannot be solved within the bureaucracy, but we can make some attempts. So recently, for instance, we have made an attempt to change our financial rules in the government of India whereby it is now mandatory that if there is a bill which is prima facie correct, it must be paid in 10 days. And failure to pay in 10 days is a violation of general financial rules. This is an obverse of the traditional government system where paying a bill is dangerous because somebody may object to the paying of the bill. But if you, uh, if you don't pay the bill, you are safe. So now we have made it dangerous on both ends. Paying the bill may be dangerous, but not paying the bill could also be dangerous. So therefore we are trying to neutralize the two incentives. Of course, this new rule is an example and it has not fully kicked in because it will take one five-year cycle of CAG to come catch a few people for not paying, write it, publish it before behaviors will begin to change. But this is the kind of thing which I think we need to do more of in terms of making it easier for officers to do the right thing so that the rules don't encourage them to do the wrong thing. Fourth is training and capacity building. Poor performance by government servants is often not deliberate. Many government servants are actually well-intentioned. They actually intend to do the right thing. They want to do the right thing. They're trying to do the right thing also. There are some who are not, but there are many who are. So the primary problem in government is not corruption. It is incompetence or inability to do the job, lack of capacity. And this is not necessarily because people are recruited badly. That is also not the case. One of the things that has happened is the pace of technological change and change in general has accelerated in recent times. And it's difficult for somebody in a full-time job to keep pace with what is going on in the outside world. So what we probably need is continuous high quality training and capacity building for civil service, especially at the lower and middle levels, not just for the IAS officers who are fairly well-trained. With the IAS officers, I think training is not the problem with the lower level officers training is part of the problem. So I think that is something where a lot needs to be done. Recently, the government of India has created a capacity building commission, which excludes with the same level of authority as the UPSC, which exclusively focuses on capacity building and has launched a mission Karma Yogi and Dr. Chandramoli, who's sitting here was the architect of some of these changes. And the, the, the key idea here is that through modern technology, you can get the best law professor to deliver a law lecture, 
record it or make it an interactive session and make every civil servant listen to the best professor instead of listening to the varying quality of professors in different state training academies or in different so you take the best of each subject prepare a world class learning capsule and deliver it through modern technology at the desk of an officer and if people like me will have our way we'll make it compulsory to pass a test on it before you can actually advance to the next level so these are things that we can do fail and it can be an online test too so these are things that are in the works and are coming and i think this is another thing that we can do to improve the efficiency with which the government functions so in conclusion let me summarize india has a realistic opportunity to become a developed country and there is no need to be pessimistic second given the changing times traditional growth engines like international trade may be less reliable for us than they were for countries like china and therefore we will have to find alternatives which will substitute for what we don't have in our peak period and therefore efficiency will be one of the factors that will be key to india's success in the future and government efficiency is an important part of that government efficiency can be improved in the non political space by measures like greatly enhanced delegation systematic efforts to improve uh, supervision changing rules to change behavior and building capacity through modern methods of training thank you best future thank you so much for such an inspirational endowment lecture sir we are deeply grateful that you could uh, take time off and share some of your thoughts on how india could gear itself into becoming a developed nation which i'm sure all of us agree we will and we are optimistic about it friends this program is also going live on zoom and we have several participants from across the globe and to them i specifically request that those who have some questions will uh, persuade the uh, two distinguished gentlemen on the head table to take a few of those questions we also have additional brains in front of the head table and if they are willing and brave they can take those questions uh, do post them there are two phd scholars waiting these questions from the madras school of economics they'll share it with me we i now invite a friend of the family a former governor of the reserve bank and chairman of the madras school of economics dr rangarajan for his presidential comments dr somnathan the honorable finance minister of tamil nadu mr parini will take a rajin mr ganapati friends of ramachandran's family and distinguished invitees uh, this is the second lecture being organized by the madras school of economics in honor of ji ramachandra two years ago when mr ganapati met me and asked me whether the madras school of economics could initiate this lecture series i readily agreed because mr ramachandra is one of india's outstanding administrators i was going to use the word one of india's most outstanding bureaucrats but the word bureaucrat has become a pejorative term and therefore i would prefer to use the word administrator rather than the bureaucrat when i was when i entered the loyola college in the 1950s Ramachandran had passed out of Loyola College at that time, and his outstanding academic performance had already made him a legend among the student community. He broke all the previous records, and everybody was looking up to him. as a role model 
And then, of course, he went on to become the administrator, moved up in the ladder. We talk of good administrators. We talk of good administration, which is the main theme today. We talk of good administrators. But good administrators are also of two categories. One, administrators who are good, who implement perfectly whatever the decisions that are being handed down. There is another group of good administrators who go beyond this, who not only execute the functions interested to them perfectly, but also look ahead, identify what the issues could be, and therefore make a contribution to policy making. It is the second group of good administrators Ramachandran belonged. In the 70s and 80s, he made significant contributions to the policy making in India. I came into personal contact with him when he was appointed as, nominated as one of the members of the Board of Governors, Central Board of Governors of the Reserve Bank of India when I was governor. And we benefited greatly by the uh, observations of Mr. Ramachandran um, in the course of various decisions that we took. So he remains a role model. And I think we need more good administrators who will not only follow the existing framework, but also suggest, as Mr. Swaminathan did, of how to modify the structure that exists. That is why I was very happy that Mr. Somanathan agreed to deliver the second lecture. And he also belongs to the second category of good administrators I mentioned them. The lecture this evening was most interesting, and should I also say was mostly entertaining. And he raised a number of issues. He spent the first half of his lecture deliberating upon what are the growth impulses in the various countries in the world at different points in time. And what should we be looking at in the next 25 years? That's important. It is important to know where we will be 25 years from now. He talked about the various calculations that he had made. And I must add, I also made my calculations. <laughs> The calculations are not very different because this is arithmetic. Because this is not something that we are saying, this is what is going to happen. We are only saying, if this is what, where we want to be in 2047, what is it that we have to do in the next 25 years? Whether we will do it or whether we will not do it is a, is a different matter. But there are problems in making this estimate. Not only because we are doing we are looking at what is going to happen 25 years from now, the length of the time period, and also the uncertainties that may prevail during this period, but also of assumptions that we have to make in order to do this calculation. We talk very much about these days that India being the fifth largest economy in the world. This is an impressive record. And some people think that we may move up to fourth or the third, that is pushing out UK and pushing out Germany. Therefore, there will be US, China, and India. As I said, this is a good and impressive record. But this record is not as impressive when you look at it in terms of the per capita income. In terms of per capita income, $1,900 or $2,000 as of now calculated. 
is very low. In the per capita income ranking, India is 142 out of 195 countries. We are actually in the bottom one third. Therefore, when you really talk about what, where we have to go, please remember that the distance we have to travel is quite a bit. As they all they say, they, the road ahead is long and we have to really accomplish much. In fact, when we talk about whether India will become a developed country or not, as Somanathan mentioned, the criterion or the indicator that you look at is actually the per capita income. Today, the level of per capita income, which is necessary to achieve the status of a developed country is $13,000. Whether that will remind the same 25 years from now, or whether we need to adjust it or not is also a question. Very often I find people making the calculations using the $13,000. We do not know what it will be. I mean, I think it, it, it depends upon what is going to happen to the dollar, its own value. But to get to $13,000, as uh, Somanathan mentioned, there are many things that we have to accomplish. First, I broadly agree with the conclu conclusion that we need to grow between seven to 8% in real terms in order to achieve this goal. But let us understand, there are critical assumptions here. One, regarding what the exchange rate will be, because ultimately you are calculating uh, the requirement in terms of dollar and then converting it into rupees. And from the present level of the rupee uh, level, uh, not rupee level, from the present level of the per capita income in rupees to reach that particular level. In fact, I do find some of my calculations have been outdated uh, because of what has happened to the rupee in the last um, uh, three few months. Because nobody expected that it will go to 82 in a, such a short period. Maybe I can tell you some of which can be reversed because if the capital flows once again resume, uh, then what might happen is the demand for the rupee will, uh, the supply of dollar will increase and it can go down. But it may not go down to the pre-crisis level. I think that is, therefore, the, the calculation is very much dependent upon what is going to happen to the exchange rate. So broadly, agreeing with him, we really need to grow at seven to eight percent. In fact, if we grow at seven percent in the next 25 years on an average, I would be happy. I mean, I think that itself is a big accomplishment. I mean, as we have not done it so far. We have done some, I mean, the, the highest growth performance was between 2005, six and 2011, 12. It is about eight to nine percent over an extended period of six years. We have not done seven percent over an extended period uh, so far. So if we can do that, it is very, uh, it is a big achievement. And the only question is whether the circumstances will permit us to achieve that or not. And Somanathan indicated some of uh, the pluses and minuses that we will have to see in the horizon. Uh, in order to achieve that uh, goal. Now, my point is, as he mentioned, the critical parameter for achieving this growth rate is the investment rate. That is where we have slipped in recent time. In between 2005, 6 and 2008, 9, 9, 10, our investment rate had crossed 34 to 35%. Somewhere around 2011-12, we came to 33.4%. And now we are at 28.8%. Not a bad number. 28.8% is not a bad number. But we have slipped. But in order to achieve the growth rate, the other important factor is, one he emphasized, the efficiency with which we use capital. He mentioned about 
how China in, has put in really more investment and not the efficiency factor counting. That, but this happened in the East Asian countries too. In fact, it was pointed out at that time that why the South Asian crisis arose, because that their investment rate was very high, but the growth rate is not commensurate with an efficient use of capital. So there are two factors that we need to take into account in order to achieve whatever level of growth rate that we want. And that is a simple Kairodoma growth model, which says that G growth rate is equal to investment rate divided by incremental capital output ratio. Incremental capital output ratio is a jargon that economists use, but it is essentially efficiency parameter. Basically what it talks about is the units of capital required to produce one unit of output. If four units of capital are required to produce one unit of output, you divide the investment rate by four, you get the growth rate. It's a simple thing. That is where the most important thing arises. If you have even 28.8%, and if you have an incremental capital output ratio of four is to one, which is then 28 divided by four will give you seven. We need to raise the investment rate because we cannot be so, uh, um, uh, so clear that it will be four is to one. And let me say, there are conditions under which the incremental capital output ratio will have to be high depending upon the pattern of investment, the type of investment, uh, uh, the, the, the type of sectors into which investment will have to be made. The higher the level of investment in the infrastructure sector, uh, the incremental capital output ratio will have to be higher. But basically, there are two things that we need to talk about. One is the investment rate going up. And the second is the efficiency with which we use a capital that is the incremental capital output ratio. Therefore, as we go ahead, we really need to raise the investment rate and at the same time, maintain the incremental capital output ratio at somewhere around four is to one so that we can comfortably achieve a growth rate of 7%. He did point out of some of the negative features that might come, what facilitated some of the countries earlier in achieving higher growth, Perhaps one most important thing that he emphasized was the expanding international trade, which uh, allowed many countries uh, to focus on export growth as a uh, lead sector in order to promote economic growth. That I think may not happen in a, in a full way. I don't think the, uh, there will be a back off totally from globalization. That may be uh, some setbacks, but globalization will continue. And I think we still have a possibility of using international trade. Please remember today, India's share in the total world trade, world exports, is not to even 2%. It's only about 1.8%. In 1915, India's share in the world trade uh, exports was 2% of the GDP, 2% of the world trade. And it came down by 1980 uh, to 0.5%, zero, that is half of 1%. And it is this which is, uh, it is this which you have to result, reverse. I am saying world trade may not be growing at the rate at which uh, it was growing earlier, but since our share in the world trade is still so small, there is still an opportunity to use the world trade window to be able to achieve it. But let me not take more time. Let me only say that the strategy of development cannot be unidimensional. It has to be multidimensional. We need a strong export growth. Strong export growth is a test of efficiency. The country can export a commodity only when it is efficient to produce that commodity. And that is why the emphasis on exports is relevant uh, because it is a test of efficiency. So it is it has to be multidimensional. We need to have a strong export growth. 
We need to have a strong manufacturing growth because it is the manufacturing growth which provides opportunities for employment at various types of talent, from a plumber to a most sophisticated engineer. Therefore, the way to move forward is in a multidimensional way. So the point is, in increasing the efficiency, what do we need to do? There are general questions uh, which arise regarding improving the uh, efficiency, uh, calculations regarding total factor productivity and so on, uh, give some idea of what we need to do. But the, in the second part of the lecture, so Mr. Swaminathan mentioned about how to improve the efficiency in the government. Because let us remember, the government is still an important player in the, in the, in the economy. It is true reforms uh, did alter the role of the government. It redefined the role of the government. But it does not necessarily diminish the role of the government. It has expanded it in some areas. It has reduced it in some areas. In the area of social infrastructure and physical infrastructure, the role of the government has gone up. Maybe in the areas in which private sector can also operate, the role of the government has come down. That is, as, as somebody cryptically remarked, more government does not mean less government, but different government. That is the essence of what is ha happening. Therefore, for example, of the total investment that is being made in the uh, economy, government still accounts for what you would call public investment, still accounts for one fourth of the, of the total. Therefore, it is important uh, that the, the, the government remains efficient. Now, what do we need to do in order to remain efficient? Uh, some other than touched on many aspects of the way in which the government functions and um, what can be done to improve it. I, I will not go into it because even though I was part of the government, but I was part of the government in, in such a way that I did not get into some of the problems that Somanathan mentioned. So let me, um, I, I, I moved at a high level and stayed at that level and therefore may be ignorant of what is happening at the bottom. So, uh, but that, that, leaving aside that, the point really is we need good policies. The only thing that we can say is good policies are necessary, but not sufficient. Good policies need to be supplemented by good and efficient administration. The two have to go together. Because if your policies are to start with the wrong, good administrators cannot do much. And therefore, we really need to have policies which are in the right direction. Then the government comes in how to implement it. And therefore, many things that you mentioned certainly are very important. And we really need to, to do it. But the question very often arises from a general point of view is, are the administrators risk covers or willing to take risk? That's an important issue. And uh, that is where all these uh, vigilance and everything comes in as, a, as an issue. And that is why one administrator said that all administrators are trained to do the things in the right way rather than to do the right things. So all, all that is required is that you should be on paper done the things in the right way. Whether that is the right thing to do is, is a different matter. So therefore the, the, the whole issue is how to do the right things in the right way. I mean, I think that is the, the, the essence of, of, the, of the problem. I do think that accountability, making the people responsible for what they're doing is essential. I will only conclude with one or two more observations. And that is, we have talked in the past about 
judging the functioning of the government in terms of what we call output and outcome. Uh, the, there is a distinction between output and outcome. When we talk of performance budgeting, we are essentially looking at whether what is budgeted for has actually been done. The budget may indicate, let's say in the education field, the number of schools to be built, the number of teachers to be appointed and many other things. So the first thing is to look at the output in terms of whether the schools have been built, uh, whether the teachers have been appointed. This is more than what you do by simply looking at whether the expenditures have incurred. So you are looking at in real terms, whether the object of the objective of the object budget has been done. But outcome is something more than that. You are not only really asking whether the schools have been constructed and the teachers have been appointed, but you are asking the question whether the level of literacy, the level of education has improved or not. That is why I think he, Swaminathan, also used the word, the quality becomes important. It is not only in quantitative terms, whether you have achieved or you have done what you are expected to do, but also what the quality of that is. So that is where essentially the importance uh, comes in. So I, um, I'm very happy that Dr. Swaminathan came to us this evening and mentioned uh, what are the essential things that we need to look at as we move ahead and certainly and also pointing out the key issues as far as the government uh, is, 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 is concerned. As I said, that all of us should focus attention on efficiency whether it is in the public sector or in the private sector. In the final analysis, it is really the quality with and the efficiency with which we use capital and labor resources that is important. People talk about demographic dividend and so on and so forth. It's, it's all based on certain assumptions. Demographic dividend uh, may be an advantage or maybe a burden too. If a large number of people enter the labor market and if you do not have jobs, if you do not have the economy growing fast enough to, to do it, uh, then it is not, it is no longer, um, um, uh, 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 it's not a dividend, but a drain. So you need to really ensure that the demographic dividend is dividend and not a dividend, the, the drain. So, uh, so we have a long way to go. As I said, if you look at it in terms of per, per capita income, we have a, to go a long distance. I will say we need to run fast, maybe faster. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the idea of a memorial lecture was planted in the family table for consideration by a close friend who just had to leave uh, for, uh, because his, uh, of a flight that he had to take. Dr. Rajmohan Rao, who arguably was the author of modern telecom industry in the revolution in the country. We at the family were skeptical about it, doing it year on year. However, at the intervention of my brother-in-law, Dr. Gangadharan, and my good friend, Dr. Raghavan, with, who was secretary of the Southern India Chamber of Com Com Commerce and Industry, he intervened and took the idea forward and stabilized it as a go-to lecture year on year. We had some distinguished speakers, leaders, in fact, in the past, notable amongst them include the present governor of RBI, the finance minister, Ms. Nirmala Sitaraman, the chairman of the finance commission, Mr. N.K. Singh, and a former governor of the RBI, Dr. Venugopal Reddy. A few years into the pandemic, 
my brother and I felt that we would be doing great tribute to my father's memory, given his passion for academics, having begun his career as a lecturer in Loyola College. And he told us that he did so because it permitted him to use the vast library that the Loyola College then had, and it enabled him to prepare for the Indian Administrative Service. Again, it was Dr. Raghavan who introduced me to both Dr. Shanmugam and Dr. Rangarajan, and we set up this endowment in the Midras School of Economics. And we even had the privilege and honor of Dr. Rangarajan volunteering to deliver the first endowment lecture. The family deems it a high privilege and honor to have one of India's most distinguished civil servant, Dr. T.V. Somanathan, the present finance secretary, to whom I reached out through one of his close colleagues and a member of our extended family, Mr. K.S. Sripati, former chief secretary of the state of Tamil Nadu. When we met him in Delhi, almost the first thing Dr. Somanathan said was, I'll come on a Saturday for the lecture. And he was so gracious in accepting it without any hesitation. The setting up of the endowment also gave us the privilege, thanks to the idea of Dr. Rangarajan, and enabled us to recognize two top students passing out of the school in the Madras School of Economics. They, of course, will be receiving their medals shortly from Dr. T.V. Somanathan in the next few minutes. A constant motivator to us has been an older brother of mine, former Foreign Secretary M. Ganapati. And of course, he has always been giving us critical inputs and giving thoughts on whom we should reach out to be the memorial speaker. And my younger brother, his hair doesn't reflect that. Mr. Ashok Vardhan Shetty has been a great friend of mine and would always motivate me to do things bigger and better. Uncle Nadrajan had to leave, but the Sri Ram group and Dr. Raj Mohan Rao have been consistently supporting these initiatives, even as we hope to make this bigger and better every year. I now have the privilege of inviting the two medal winners of the outgoing batch of the Madras School of Economics, PGDM. May I request the G. Ramachandran gold medals to Ms. Sahana Sita Raman and Ms. Savita Rao in that order, please. I now request Mr. C. N. Gangadharan to honor our chief guest, Dr. T. V. Somanadhan. Put it on the trail. I now have the honor of thanking Dr. C. Rangarajan. I caught him on a Sunday morning, evening rather, at 4.30, probably woke him out of his siesta and said, would you like to do the honor this year? Without hesitation, Mr. Vikram Kapoor said, yes, Barkis is willing. Thank you so much, Sadi.
telephone table in the right corner. Handing over the auditorium was the easiest bit, but handing over his heart and effort. I must thank Dr. Ravi Kumar for backing us in this effort in such a short note. It was almost sir, like the Indian Barad. I've seen so many of them in Delhi. Uh, you know, we had time uh, from last Sunday morning to put this together. And in fact, we got everything ready as Dr. Somanathan was driving in. And I think the huge effort was <laughs> heavy lifting was done by MSC. Dr. Ravi Kumar, thanks so much. And you also gave me Dr. Gangadharan of the Madras School of Economics. As I, it, I, it was a, almost a package kind of a deal that was given to us to get this going. In fact, we had three intervening holidays. And uh, I'll thank my office team separately. But, We will be taking a few questions after I recognize the man who gave this idea and has been helping us continuously for the last eight years, Dr. Raghavan. Please come and accept it from the eldest member of our family, Dr. Gangadhar. We have a few questions that have come online while we get them ready, but members here would like to seek out some questions to Dr. Swaminathan. Identify yourself and go ahead. The mic will come to you the minute you raise your hand. I'm John Morris, Chartered Accountant. It's a great privilege in participating in this great lecture. Sir, my only small question is, we have 140 crore people in India. Why still we are having in charges, the top positions or officials, like private, why not we put, whether we don't have resources or anything? Can you address this, sir? It is literally spoiling the things, I think. Three, four charges. It's never charged. Uh, <laughs> that's a very charged question. I don't <laughs> want to answer it. I, I, I'm afraid I won't want to answer that. That goes beyond uh, the responsibilities that I hold. And it enters but somewhere where I would some, prefer not to discuss. Somebody has to take this there now. Is it I've taken note of your point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think Chella Krishna. Oh, sorry. After, uh, the Tande bill payment rule. Can you identify yourself, uh, sir? My name is Vengada Chalabi, Rajeshri Global. 10-day pay uh, bill payment rule is mandatory. Now, is it possible for you to extend this to the GST outstanding for states? Is there any possibility that the government of India will pay the GST outstanding on the 10th day of the next month? My answer is the same as the previous question. <laughs> Chandra Krishna, second row, Murli, Inga. Good evening. Thank you for addressing us. My question so is, I'm yes, not here in my official capacity. So I'm not <laughs> here to discuss what I do as finance secretary. I am here to discuss the topic that has been assigned to me. So I will answer questions on the topic that I have discussed. Perfect. I'm not here to give a press conference or to discuss government of India. I'm not here in my official capacity. I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I said that right at the beginning. Therefore, I can't answer. I think you need to respect that. Fair enough. Uh, my question is actually on your presentation today. On If one were to look at efficiency in government, um, would outsourcing help? For example, there was a there was an outsourcing done to TCS for the passport. It turned out to be a damn good success. You get a passport within a week, 10 days. Is government identifying such similar things where they, they, they do a lot more governance and the rest of it is actually private sector? Can, can a model be developed in that format? I think uh, you're referring to TCS. There are other similar models. It's a success. This has been a success. And that is something that should be uh, done in greater measure in a lot of citizen-facing services. And that is also the direction in which the government is uh, moving. And uh, it has been done. Now, let me 
also just i want to make a small you know sort of uh, don't take it too seriously but you know some of the outsourcing service providers have also bungled from time to time and these are some of the biggest names in the country i won't name them we had some very big names who have bungled on very big contract because they think it's a government contract government dane meduva pannikala so there also the question of you know good enough for government is a sort of standard which some of our best companies have adopted and that has been a problem in several of the very big applications that the government has rolled out and uh, therefore the government needs to supervise that also before you don't get good results from the private sector even from the best named marquee companies unless they are supervised so possibly mine too is an example of a great citizen service interface the covin app done uh, without any fuss and without any delay uh, so, sir good evening uh, this is krishnan uh, uh, very nice presentation uh, what do you think about the global debt against gdp it is like no actually most of the countries are facing it's, it's going to be a huge problem as a as as a policy financial planner what do you think is you know uh, what are the problem which you think we should face what kind of steps so i think there are two kinds of debt there is private debt and there is government debt so uh, there are some countries like china has a very high level of private debt to gdp though their public finances are in good shape compared to us they actually have lower government debt to gdp but they have much higher private debt to gdp the problems resulting from the two are different uh it almost i mean it partly depends on how well that credit is used if there's high private credit to gdp but if it's used in highly productive enterprises and the gdp grows faster than the uh, it's what's called debt dynamics that is the the capital the interest on that capital grows at a particular pace if the gdp or the denominator is growing faster then it can decline even with an expanding debt so it's again it comes back to the productivity of the investments that we make if we make good investments then we can take on more debt but if we take on debt and don't invest it properly then you will sooner or later run into some kind of debt trap so yes there are many countries with high levels of debt to gdp and i'll also mention that there is a sort of um apartheid system in terms of government debt to gdp which is that there are countries which have 250% of uh, debt to gdp and are considered very safe Now, partly it's because they have very low interest rates. Correct. You see, some of them have very low interest rates, so the debt service costs of a high debt is low. But there is there are countries which have much lower GDP uh, debt to GDP and are considered less safe, even though they have very high growth rates. So yes, there is a there is some of it is real in terms of the debt dynamics. Some of it is perception that institutions which are centered abroad. do tend to view the same arithmetic differently depending on whether it's a developed country or a developing country that is a kind of discrimination that i think an emerging economy has to live with and you know overcome there is no point complaining about it that's the way the world is we live in this real world and we have to work with it sir so dr rangarajan would like to layer it you know the debt to gdp ratio if we look at it among the various countries in the world it varies very very uh, very much I mean, there are countries which have twice the gdp too there are some countries which are less therefore there are two things one as he pointed out first is how do you use that money that you have borrowed and the whole idea of uh, the golden rule in the uk was that you don't worry about the fiscal deficit so long as that fiscal deficit is only for capital use i mean i think it is only a fiscal deficit which um uh, uses it for co consumption expenditure government consumption expenditure which is bad but the point really is the interest burden is the, the critical important thing finally it is why are we saying that the gdp ratio is too high and therefore we cannot do it? it is really the interest burden there are countries in the world where the ratio of revenue raised by the government as a proportion of gdp is much higher than ours that, that is dependent upon the fact that we are a low per capita income country they are other high per capita income country so long as the revenue to gdp ratio is higher then it permits you to have a higher debt gdp ratio because you can service that debt much more easily so these are other considerations that one has to take so i invite uh, mr vishwanathan editor of industrial economy thanks uh, dr you have uh, made an excellent presentation on the possibilities 
two areas raised, one raised by Dr. Angarajan raises some concern. The depreciation of the rupee in a very extremely high velocity rate it is taking place. We don't seem to have much control over this. Over a very short time from 60, 65, 70, it has come to about 81, 82 rupees. This is a much of grave concern. When you look at a 25 year perspective and start in terms of a 7% growth rate, do we have a concrete plan to address this question? And one more, sir, on the same issue of this, your uh, projections are conditional on the foreign trade issue. Look at the recent problem with, say, FTA with Britain. We have been telling that we can have it by Deepavali. Now the reports today say that's uncertain. Three of the major ministers of UK said that it is not possible to have a commitment on this. Both these are a very serious impact in, impact on your projections for 75, 25 years. I didn't make any projection. You didn't, sir. I did not make any projection for 25 years. years. I want to correct you. I have not made any projection for 25 years. I did a little of, I, I said that if it is to reach this, then the rate of, so that's not a projection, one. Number two, on the exchange rate, the rupee has actually appreciated against the British pound, against the Chinese yuan, against the Japanese yen, against the Singapore dollar, against the UAE dirham. So I think we are talking about a dollar appreciation, not a rupee depreciation. I think it's important to characterize this correctly. I would like you to show me which currency is appreciated against the dollar in the last few months. So, sorry? That is true of most countries. So this is a phenomenon that I think we have to learn to live with. And if we try to get anchored onto some artificial rate of exchange, or if we see this as an indicator of economic performance, I think that's very wrong. I think the exchange rate is not an indicator. In fact, the Chinese economy grew because they deliberately undervalued their currency for 25 years. They kept depressing it below its market value by specific state action. So I think this notion that the value of the rupee is a, it, it connotes some indicator of strength or weakness is not correct. It's neither strength nor weakness. A high rupee is neither good nor bad. It depends on what circumstances are, whether it's overvalued or undervalued relative to its purchasing power, relative to its trade weighted exchange rate. So those are different considerations. And I think in today's economy, we live in a world where what happens abroad will affect you willy nilly. So let us be honest about this. There is nothing that any government can do to prevent this. I have not found the Japanese government able to do this. I have not found the you know, Chinese government able to do this. I have not found the European Central Bank able to do it. I have not found the British government able to do it. And the Indian government also has not done it. So I think we are in good company. And uh, I don't think there is much that we can do about it. I think we have to let exchange rates find the level that market forces will take them to one. In fact, it is quite dangerous to try and resist these forces. You will fritter away reserves uh, on what is completely worthless, which is trying to hold some imaginary correct rate of exchange. There is no such exchange rate, number one. Number two, on the free trade agreement, India has very clearly decided that it will negotiate free trade agreements which are in India's interest. We will not do free trade agreements for the sake of doing free trade agreements or to say that some free trade agreement has been done. So this agreement with the UK will happen when it happens. So I am not, as a, I, I, again, that's not something that I'm in a position to discuss, but these are, this is how international negotiations happen. International negotiations don't happen with deadlines. A deadline cannot be a way of ending a negotiation against yourself. So I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything about the negotiations. What I'm saying is, both countries are entitled to negotiate for what they see as their national interest. It is a confluence of those two interests that is negotiated. That's why it's negotiated. So the negotiations will happen and the result will come when it comes. So I'm not in a position to say when it will come, but I'll also add one thing. I don't think, as I said, that India's growth over the next 25 years depends on concluding free trade agreements with the UK or EU. It does not. I think India can grow with or without them. Something may be beneficial if we do it, it may be less beneficial if we don't. But we are not necessarily, our growth is not contingent on doing them. So in the interests of uh, educating a, and sharing your knowledge with a few of our students here, uh, we have a couple of questions from the PhD scholars. Would you like to take them, sir? And ahead of that, I, uh, my own question to you is, uh, yes, the world recognizes there is an issue on the currency. That, 
as somebody whose income is 95% from the US, I'm entirely happy with it, but the rest of may not be. But do you expect a plaza hotel type of uh, meeting to take place going forward? No. You don't expect it. No. An effort was made. I don't know. I, I, I'm <laughs> ignorant, but I don't, I don't <laughs> expect it. That may be because of ignorance. <laughs> Sir, Vivek, a PhD scholar from here, wishes to ask you, as you all know, China is now known as world's manufacturing center. Sh should India focus more on manufacturing than depending on service? The next question is from Ashwin, also a PhD scholar from here. In the context of increasing public expenditure, how can we ensure that the quality of public services and infrastructure is improved? And I've censored a few questions. No, you don't have to censor them. I love <laughs> doing my own. Sense. But anyway, so on the first one, uh, that is uh, the first question was, can you just give me a repeat that? China. So yeah, so manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think we have a young workforce and it would be good for India to grow into labor intensive manufacturing. So there are areas such as garments, leather. There are many sectors where India has potential to grow and to compete. So that is, I would agree with the questioner that our growth over the next 25 years is not just GDP growth. It needs to be employment generating Generate. GDP growth for which uh, sectors like manufacturing provide. It's not all manufacturing. Some ends of manufacturing are so capital intensive that they don't create any worthwhile jobs. So we it's which kind of industry is labor intensive and we have to be competitive in those industries. Now here again, there are certain things that we should be aware of. We often hear that Bangladesh is far better than us at garments and textiles. True and not true. It is true. They are somewhat more efficient than us in terms of some of the clearances and the pollution and the, the time we take and so on. They are. But it is also true that they there is a general system of preferences where government Bangladesh as an LDC, a less developed country, gets preference in import duties when they export to Europe or the UK, not to the US, but to Europe and UK, they get a five to 6% duty advantage. So this is one of the reasons why Bangladesh has an advantage, Vietnam has an advantage. So it is a mix of all these factors. Yes, India needs to become better at labor intensive manufacturing. I think that's an important um, part of how India will have to grow in the next 25 years. And that is definitely a priority. Thank you so much, sir. I have uh, one more question. Yes, on no, sir. Uh, that... Quality of expenditure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that is a very important point. The same amount of money spent well is going to generate much more productive results than the same amount of money spent badly. And uh, yes, our public expenditure, both at state and central level, needs an improvement in terms of the quality of expenditure. There are a number of uh, you know ways in which we can do this. Some of them would be improved targeting of some of our subsidies so that we actually make better use of the limited financial resources that we have. But that's a very brief answer. It would need a much longer answer, which obviously- Yes, sir. Have yes sir. So thank you so much, sir. And uh, I now ask my brother who's come from uh, Palo Alto, California for this to deliver the word of thanks. I'll make this short and sweet. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver the word of thanks to everyone who has gathered on site and to people like Karthik from remotely. I would like to thank our chief guest, Dr. T.K. Swaminathan, for taking the time from his private visit to Chennai to deliver this lecture and giving us all some thought-provoking uh, items to think about. I would like to talk, thank Dr. Rangarajan for preparing and delivering his presidential address at a very short notice. Mr. Vikram Kapoor, you knew our father well, and thank you for your tribute to him. Our grateful thanks to the Dean of Academic Affairs, Dr. K.S. Kavi Kumar, for his welcome address. Our thanks to also to faculty member and administrative officer, Dr. Gangadharan, for his help and guidance in organizing this. Our family is grateful to Mr. Raghavan, formerly Sikhi, for his spontaneous offer of help during the holidays. I'd like to thank Karthik for his tribute to his uncle. And I'd like to thank Madhura Ganesh for introducing the chief guest. Nothing happens, as you guys know, in my family without the heroic efforts of my brother, Mr. Ganapati. Thank you, Ganpat. I would also be remiss here if I did not thank the support staff at my brother's office and Mr. Jacob for sacrificing their holiday weekend to work tirelessly on this event's organization. Thank you. And my thanks also to my brother-in-law and staunch supporter of this initiative, Mr. Gangadharan. And once again, thank you all for 
for all of you who attended remotely and on site for taking the time to attend. Thank you. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharata bhagya vidhata Punjab Singh Gujarat Maratha Ravida Uttala Vanga Indra Himachala Yamuna Ganga Uchala Jaladhita Ranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Ashish Mange Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Janagana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 Ja